I'm grateful to be here this evening. I want to pick up where we left off this morning um, when we were talking about um, some of the apologetic ideas. Now, Lewis wrote about all kinds of things. So consequently, since he wrote about so much, we're just picking some flowers from the garden. There's too much to cover. But nevertheless, I left off with the idea of materialism. But I'm going to pray one more time also, if you don't mind. Father, um, again, one evening and a lifetime of evenings, I pray that each of us would hear something from you and that we would sense your love that you took from the words of one person something that had meaning in each of our hearts. And I pray, Father, that that would happen this evening, and we know it can't happen without the work of your Holy Spirit. So please, Father, let your Holy Spirit be at work in a manner that glorifies Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Yesterday we talked about some of the longings. Lewis sensed the longings. He was nurtured by the longings and looked for the proper object. When he was a materialist, he felt that these longings were nothing more than the chemistry, the body chemistry of uh, the very things that we said the materialist was given to. When he saw the incongruity in his materialism, he rejected it. There's an essay called uh, Religion, Reality, or Substitute. It's in Christian Reflections. And he sets forth what he calls the insoluble difficulties of materialism in that essay, if you want to read more detail. Um, the other thing, too, in a letter he wrote to Sheldon von Alken, he connects um, the longings and shows how materialism is false. In the little book that Marge was uh, sharing with us about to, this morning, um, the letters that are in uh, Severe Mercy. In one of those letters, Lewis uh, had received a letter from von Alken where he said he thought the materialistic universe was ugly. Lewis responded, you say the materialist universe is ugly? I wonder how you discovered that. If you are really the product of a materialistic universe, how is it you don't feel at home there? Do fish complain of the sea for being wet? Or if they did, would that fact itself not strongly suggests that they had not always been or would not always be purely aquatic creatures. Notice how we're perpetually surprised at time, how time flies. Fancy John being grown up and married. I can hardly believe it. In heaven's name, and he says heaven significantly, in heaven's name, why? Unless indeed there is something in us which is not temporal. Now, once Lewis saw the problems with materialism, all of a sudden then these longings came rushing in on him again, and he realized maybe there is an object to these longings. So he moves from his atheism and the worldview materialism, and he drifts towards agnosticism. But Lewis said, in surprise by joy, amiable agnostics will talk cheerfully about man's search for God. To me, as I was then, they might as well have talked about the mouse's search for the cat. <laughs> So we can talk about at least three different types of agnostics. There could be the dogmatic agnostic. I don't know, you don't know, nobody can know. Well, the dogmatic agnostic isn't being fair. He's basically like the wolf in sheep's clothing. He's the atheist in agnostic's garb. He knows the atheist position isn't defensible, so he tries to put it in, in the agnostic uh, uh, position. But you can't be a dogmatic agnostic. It's hard to be dogmatic about what you don't know. <laughs> the dogmatic agnostic could say, maybe, I don't know, that's fair. He may think that you don't know because he sees incongruity in some of your arguments, like Socrates did in the people he debated with in Athens. But for him to say, nobody can know, he drifts into the same sort of problem as the atheist. Then you have the, the disinterested agnostic. I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. Is that a legitimate position to hold in relationship to things concerning God? N not if we are in any way sensitive to the whole history that's preceded us. Mortimer Adler, who put together the great books of the Western world, spent two and a half million dollars in 1948 having researchers call through the great books of the Western tradition to find out what were the most discussed ideas and he found that there were 102 major ideas. So he set to work writing an essay about each of these ideas, tracing its first appearance, maybe in the early Greek playwrights, all the way through the Western tradition, and each person who added to it. By the way, so it's a wonderful thing. 
Uh, how many of you have ever been in a reading group where you're going to read a book a month and discuss it, right? And the reading group goes along just great. You know, we're going to read The Discarded Image. We're going to read The Great Divorce. We're going to read um, um, uh, maybe Wind in the Willows or something like this. And then all of a sudden somebody says, this month let's read War and Peace. And everybody's guilty and nobody shows up to the reading group the next week. But, but, but what, if, what if we read an essay a month? I heard Mortimer Adler say one time he didn't think he became educated until he was 60 years old. Students shot up his hand. Said, if you said you didn't think you became educated until you were 60, you must have a standard for what an educated person looks like. What is it? He said, I don't think you need to have an exhaustive understanding, but you need to have a working understanding of the 102 great ideas. That's interesting. So we've had discussion groups where we read an idea a month. These essays are about, I don't know, 15 to 20 pages long. And you come together, everybody could read that in a month or a week, and you have this discussion. 102 essays, 102 weeks, or 102 months, and you'll be educated, right? Well, anyway, of all these ideas, you know what the number one idea is? Nothing even compares to it. Nothing even comes close to the frequency of its discussion in the literature. The idea of God. The idea of God is number one. The idea of knowledge, how you know and how you know you know, is two. Man is two. Uh, thir third, we're mysteries to ourselves. We're trying to understand what human nature is all about. Four is the state, man and human society. And five is love. But God is number one. You know what Adler wrote about the idea of God in this essay? He said, more consequences for thought and action follow from an affirmation or denial of God than from answering any other basic question. They follow for those who regard the question as answerable only by faith or only by reason, and even for those who insist upon uh, suspending judgment entirely. There's no question that's more important than this. How could we be apathetic about this particular issue? We're, we're running against the grain of the tide of history, if that's the case. Furthermore, uh, Pascal, you, you've studied his wager, I know. Uh, Pascal said, in, 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 you can't live a day of your life without being, by the way, influenced by Pascal. He was the first guy to develop a modern calculator. Early computer language was called Pascal in his honor. Um, he was the guy that developed the, the, the science of hydraulics. And consequently, every time you put your, your foot on your brakes of your car, you could say, thanks, Pascal. Every time you turn on your computer, you could say, thanks, Pascal. He invented a barometer. Every time you hear a weather report, you could say, thanks, Pascal. He invented the first rapid transit system for Paris. Every time you get on a plane or a bus or a train, you could say, thanks, Pascal. Um, he developed the laws of probability to save a friend of his fortune, because he thought this guy was gambling in a stupid manner. Of course, I don't know if there's any manner that's less than stupid, I suppose, when it comes to gambling. But he applied it to matters not of faith. It's not a proof for the existence of God, but it is certainly a proof for why being apathetic about the issue of God is not wise. If I believe and I'm right and, and I die, I gain everything. If I believe and I'm wrong and death is the end of all things, I lose nothing. If I disbelieve and I'm right, when I die, I gain nothing. If I disbelieve and I'm wrong, I lose everything. But only in this wager, I'm not gambling dollars and cents. I'm gambling my eternal destiny. It's not something to be apathetic about. And, and interestingly enough, there was a man who, who actually attended uh, Wheaton College years ago, Robert Eckfall. He was a class of 1923. He went to Tibet, and he was a missionary in Tibet. I read a book he wrote years ago when he got to Tibet. He got to know this Eastern Tibetan Buddhist monk. And they developed a friendship. And over six months, he would talk with him about Jesus, and the monk would talk with him about Buddhism. Finally, the monk comes to Ekval and says, I want to become a Christian. And Ekval leads him to faith. And then he says to him, why did you become a Christian? He said, well, I believe in reincarnation, and the way I've got it figured, you're going to get as many lives as you need till you put it together, if, if I'm right. But if you're right, this is the only life I've got, and I would rather make sure that I was okay, I'll become a Christian. So it's basically Pascal's wager in an Eastern setting, but it does show the example that it's not something to be apathetic about. 
The other is the dissatisfied agnostic, and this is eventually where Lewis comes. And the dissatisfied agnostic says, I don't know, but I'd like to know. It's what John Donne called honest doubt in his poem, Satire 3. Doubt wisely. And a strange way to stand inquiring right is not to stray, but to sleep or run wrong is. And Pascal said in the Pensee, in the end, there are two kinds of reasonable people, those who seek for God, though they do not know him, and those who seek to follow God because they do know him. Okay, with this in mind, then, Lewis finally comes to the place, and there's a lot of other, uh, other things going on here for Lewis, but he finally comes to the place where he's interested in the question of religion, but which religion? And let's say there's a few preliminary considerations to see how Lewis moves through this whole uh, area of thought. In Mere Christianity, he makes this a statement, just because you're a Christian does not mean you have to believe everything about the other religions are necessarily false. But if you are a Christian, you must believe that those things unique to Christianity are true, and the other religions at those points are false. So what are some common things? Well, basically, there's a sociological fact of religion. Virtually all cultures are religious cultures. Maybe our materialistic West isn't, but a lot of times we're pretty religious about our things, pretty devoted to our things and our pursuit of our things. Uh, Harold Best, who used to be the dean of the Conservatory of Music here, years ago said, God made us as worshiping beings, and if we'll not worship God, we'll worship something in his place. The, 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 all societies virtually are worshiping societies. Um, the other thing, too, is the Christian is always closer to the person of any religion than any of us would be to the materialist, because there's at least a religious hunger uh, evident there. In the introduction to the problem of pain, Lewis shows that he was deeply influenced by one of his favorite authors, Rudolf Otto, who was a German philosopher of religion who wrote the idea of the holy. And Otto said there were three things he saw that were in common with all the great world religions. Lewis outlines these in the introduction to the problem of pain. Number one, all the great world religions believe in some divine essence. He calls it the numinous. They may define it differently if they're an animist, a pantheist, a polytheist, a dualist, a monotheist, or a monotheistic trinitarian, but they believe in some transcendent other. Second, all the great world religions believe in a moral law, a moral law that we all fail to keep and we fall short of our own standard. Thirdly, am I going too fast if you're taking notes on that? They all believe in a divine essence. Secondly, they believe in a moral law that people fail to keep. And thirdly, they believe that the divine essence is a custodian of the moral law. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll show you how I was able to use it in a witnessing situation. And then, what are the things then that are unique to Christianity in light of that? Well, the problem is, if there's a moral law and we fail to keep it, and the divine essence is a custodian of the moral law, we've offended the divine essence. How do we fix what's broken in us? Virtually all the other great world religions will give you a new set of rituals or standards or new kinds of things that you need to do to sort of work your way back into the favor of the divine essence. If I couldn't keep the first set of moral laws, why do I have confidence I'll keep the second set? And it all becomes sort of works-oriented. Only Christianity says man can't fix the problem. He needs grace. And the incarnation is God's provision. So Evelyn Underhill, an author who, by the way, uh, she was the first woman given university-wide lecture status at Oxford University. Um, she wrote to C.S. Lewis after his uh, Out of the Silent Planet, and she praised him for that book. He wrote her back. Both letters are extant. He wrote her back and said, receiving a letter from you is the greatest literary experience of my life. After he wrote The Problem of Pain, she wrote him again. So I don't know if you remember me or not. I wrote you after All the Sign of Planet. He said, remember you, receiving a letter from you was the greatest literary experience of my life. He says it twice. Um, she praises him for The Problem of Pain. She liked that book. But she did say that the passage on animals was about the worst thing she had read in her life. And she said, I think uh, that your vision of God is a little too tame. It lacks a little wildness. 
There's one Lewis scholar who says he, he thinks that Lewis's Aslan is good, but he's not tame might have come from that letter. I don't know for sure if it did or not, but it's interesting. It's an interesting thing. Anyway, Underhill said all religions have their mystics, all of them. But the difference between the mystic generally and the Christian mystic is that the, 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 the mystics generally are those who are questing after God. But Christian mysticism are those who find an encounter with the incarnate Christ, who comes to us at the place of our longing. But not only that, Christianity is itself a kind of incarnational religion because he not only comes to us, he also deploys us into the world as his ambassadors in the world. So it has that serving sense to it. Um, Lewis also, in an essay called Some Thoughts, it's in God in the Dock, talks about the blessed two-edged character of Christianity. The blessed two-edged character of Christianity. And this is in a work called Some Thoughts in God in the Dock. He said Christianity is one of the world-affirming religions, like Confucianism and the great agricultural religions of Mesopotamia. We're not Gnostic. We believe the material world has value. Um, and the world is not essentially evil, even though it may be fallen. And then he also says that we're one of the world-denying religions, like Hinduism and like Buddhism. It's, it's interesting to me. We had a dear friend, Claudia and I, a friend named Steve Urban. Steve Urban um, had a girlfriend who died, and he didn't know what, what that meant. He hadn't really encountered death at his relatively young age. So it sent him on a spiritual quest, and he ended up studying Tibetan Buddhism with the Dalai Lama. And I met him the week he got back after five months' study in Tibet. And, and a junior high kid at the church, I was a college pastor out of a church in California at that time in the 70s. This junior high kid said, I want you to meet my friend. He just got back from Nepal from studying under the Dalai Lama. And I said, okay, I forgot all about it. The next night at church, this kid Todd brings Steve. He says, this is my friend Steve. And then Todd disappears. And so I go, uh, Todd says, you've been traveling a little bit. I didn't know what to say to him. I said, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. How about if we have breakfast tomorrow morning? We met for breakfast at 7 in the morning, and we met till 11 o'clock. I said, I think my wife would like to hear about this. How about if you come over for dinner Thursday night? So he comes over for dinner Thursday night, and thus it went for nine months. We met every Tuesday morning for breakfast and every Thursday night for dinner. And we heard his story. And, and, and he told me that, that when he got there, one of the things about Buddhism, and while there are many stripes of Buddhism, if you talk with people of other religions, they may be classified as Buddhist or Hindu or, or Muslim. But we as Christians know there's many stripes of Christians. Are they cops? Are they Orthodox? Are they Catholic? Are they Protestants? If they're Protestants, what stripe of Protestant? If they're Catholic, what stripe of Catholic? There's complexity, but there are some things that will be common. So Siddhartha, the, the Gautam, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, was a prince. He went out to see his people, and he saw that they were suffering, and he wanted to solve the problem of human suffering. How could he do this? He felt that the suffering was a consequence of unfulfilled expectation. So he thought, if we could eliminate expectation, we'll eliminate suffering. So when my friend Steve went to... Uh, Nepal, one of the things he had to do was go into a mosquito-infested trailer and stay there for as long as it took for him, not in any way, to be concerned about the mosquitoes. He was there for a, a week, letting his body be bit by mosquitoes for a week before finally he said, okay, I don't care anymore. And that's, that's really moving forward. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about you, but that doesn't do anything for me. We Christians look at it differently. We do believe that there are some disappointments that are a result of unfulfilled expectation. But like Augustine, we understand the ordo amorous, ordered love. Put first things first, C.S. Lewis writes in his essay, first and second things, you get second things thrown in. Put second things first and you lose out on first and second things. We go to Ecclesiastes. One, one biblical scholar talked about the poetic books of the Bible as the how-to books. Job, how to what? 
suffer. Psalms, how to what? How to worship, right? Except sometimes people say to me, I think that the Psalms are so comforting. I say, I don't think you're reading the same ones I'm reading. Didn't I talk about that already? Didn't I mention? Sometimes I think David's bipolar, you know, it's kind of goofy. But it's how to worship in good times and bad. Proverbs, how to be wise. Song of Solomon, how to love. Ecclesiastes, how to be confused about life, you know what? <laughs> no. Ecclesiastes, how to enjoy life. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity where? Under the sun. 28 times in that book it mentions it. You will never be satisfied if you're looking at things at only the under sun perspective. Why? Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has placed eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes 2.25, probably the key verse of that book. For who can eat and who can enjoy life without him? Give me all the earthly pleasures, take God away, they'll never satisfy. Give me God and I can enjoy life properly. Not like the Buddhist who says, get rid of all expectation. But find expectation in proper order, in proper place, in proper time. Well, you know what? how Steve came to faith? Claudia gave him a copy of Surprised by Joy. And he read Surprised by Joy. Lewis had the longings. But he found the proper object of the longings and was able to understand these. So I think you might have a copy of the book he wrote on mere Christianity here, Steve Urban, the same guy. He's a medical doctor now in, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and he's done a book, a study, a wonderful study guide on, on mere Christianity. And he teaches C.S. Lewis courses at his church, not too shabby. Anyway, so, so here is this, this approach to the religions of the world where C.S. Lewis quotes something he got from Charles Williams. Charles Williams thought it was in Augustine, but he could never find it. I don't know where Williams ultimately got it. But Lewis and Williams say you can say of anything, anything you see, this also is thou. God is in this. He is present in the world he's made. But if you stop there, you'll become an idolater. So you also have to say, neither is this thou. God is not only present and imminent in things, he's also transcendent and beyond things. So we come up with two ways of worship. You have what they call the cataphatic approach to worship. Kata, down. God present in the things he's made. Cataphatic. Um, you have the apophatic, apa, away from. So the apophatic is where you call, pray, worship with your eyes closed. Shut out the world and all distractions to focus on the one. Um, if it goes south, where does it go? It drifts towards legalism. Remember when you were, uh, how many of you have grown up in an apophatic tradition? Eyes closed, shut out the world, and focus on God. Okay, we've got a lot of Anglicans in here, so I suppose most of you are cataphatic. Okay, apophatic. When it goes south, it goes towards legalism. So you're sitting at the dinner table one night, and one of the kids after grace before the meal says, Mom, Johnny didn't have his eyes closed while we prayed. <laughs> and the first legalist was born right there. <laughs> cataphatic is to pray with eyes wide open. God is here. You look at the cataphatic traditions. You've got colors of the calendar. You've got the whole sensory experience of worship. You've got smells and bells and flavors, tastes, and so on. <clears throat> and when it goes south, where does it go? Towards idolatry. Towards idolatry. What's the corrective? To move towards the one that you're not exposed to. The apophatic need to open their eyes. The cataphatic may have to shut things out. And there's this balance in the Christian tradition. This also is thou, neither is this thou. And, and, and Jesus talks about it, too. He said, John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he was a crazy man. The Son of Man came eating, both eating and drinking, and they said he was a, fr a, a friend of sinners and a glutton. He said, wisdom is vindicated by her children. So you've got this balance in the Christian approach that Lewis sees. He's interested in this. Not only that, what about the Trinity? And this was an interesting one, too. Lewis writes in The Problem of Pain, we learn from the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity that something analogous to society exists within the divine being from all eternity. That God is love, not merely in the sense of being the platonic form of love, 
but because within him the concrete reciprocities of love exist before all worlds and are thence derived to the creatures. What does he mean by that? Charles Williams, his friend, put it this way, speaking of the Aryans and the Muslims, that they denied love to God except by means of his creation. What did they mean by that? As I thought about it, I realized, oh, I get it. Now, this is a question you could ask any um, non-Trinitarian monotheist, somebody who's Jewish, a Jehovah's Witness, or a Muslim. I have had these witnessing experiences, learning from Lewis and now applying it to the gospel. Let me put it in context. I was at um, O'Hare Airport. I was coming back to Wheaton College. Um, we, we use a limo service if we have to go back and forth. And this guy who picks me up says, I'm taking you to Wheaton College. Uh, what do you do there? I said, I'm a professor there. He said, uh, um, what, what, you, what do you teach? And I said, well, my degree is in philosophy of religion. He said, what religion are you? This man's name was Hafiz, Hafiz Muhammad. He said, what, what, what re religion are you? I said, I'm a Christian. What religion are you? He says, I'm a Muslim. Then he says to me, um, what, do, what do Christians believe? What's the difference between Christianity and Islam, he said. I said, well, I have to confess to you, I've read my Bible many times, but I've only read the Quran halfway. I haven't read the whole Quran. So I'll defer to you on anything related to the Quran. I said, but I do know that Surah 3 and Surah 6 says that Muslims are not worshipers of the Trinity. You don't believe in a Trinitarian God. I said, the doctrine of the Trinity is very important for us Christians. And I said, before I explain that to you, though, I mentioned the thing about C.S. Lewis. I said, if you're a Christian, you have to believe all the other religions are necessarily false. But if you are a Christian, you have to believe those differences. Christianity is true and the other religions are not. And I said, in big part, it has to do with this doctrine of the Trinity. And I said, let me ask you these questions. Number one, do you, do you believe God's a contingent being or a non-contingent being? And oftentimes when I talk with Muslims, they'll say, what do you mean by contingent? And you have to explain to them, do you believe there's a cause for God, or do you believe that God's a necessary being? He's always existed. And, and Hafiz got it, and he said, I believe he's non-contingent. I said, well, Hafiz, second question, do you believe God's a God of love? He said, yes. I've had this conversation with at least 200 Muslims. They always say yes. I would expect them to say, I believe he's a just God or a merciful God or a good God. I, I didn't actually expect that they would say he was a God of love, but they've always said it. Yes. Third question, who's the object of his love? And they're reduced to saying creation. And if God needs creation in order to exhibit love, then he's a contingent being and not a non-contingent being. And there's an inherent contradiction in all non-Trinitarian monotheism. Because relational attributes like love and a non-contingent being presuppose that relationship is necessary in that being. And this is what Lewis is saying. We learn from the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity that something analogous to society exists within the divine being from all eternity. That God is love not merely in the sense of being the platonic form of love, but because within him the concrete reciprocities of love exist before all worlds and thence derive to the creatures. So consequently, Hafiz said, I'm tracking with you. I, I get what you're saying. It was a moment of disequilibrium for him. We're on the threshold of potential change. And so I said, well, Hafiz, here's another thing. The C.S. Lewis also uh, citing Rudolf Otto. I went to that first chapter of uh, uh, Problem of Pain where Rudolf Otto said, that um, all the great religions believe in some divine essence. He said, I'm tracking with you. No less than 18 times in this conversation, Hafiz said, I'm tracking with you. And, 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 and I said, all the great world religions also believe in a divine, uh, I, I, I mean, a moral law that they fail to keep. He said, I'm tracking with you. I said, and all the great world religions believe the divine essence is a custodian of the moral law, so if we've failed to keep it, we've offended the divine essence. He said, I'm tracking with you. He said, I believe in the supernatural. I believe in the afterlife. I believe in hell. 
and I don't want to go there. And he says, I'm trying to live the best life I can. There's the now new rituals. I'm trying to live the best life I can. I said, Hafiz, do you believe that God is a perfect being? He said, yes, I do. I said, how is your best doing? He said, I live in fear. And I said, here's the difference now between Christianity and Islam. We believe you don't have to live in fear. That the God of the universe loves you. That he forgives all of your failures and shortcomings, what the Bible calls sin. And he wants to enter into your life and be Lord of your life and bring order out of the chaos. And Hafiz said, I'm tracking with you. I want that. And in the car, he prayed out loud to trust Christ with me on our drive the rest of the way home. And then I was able to engage and follow up with him. Now, the thing that's interesting to me is this. All of that I got from C.S. Lewis. And I was able to apply it in this situation. I have students all the time. They say, yeah, we'd like to go, you know, and do uh, Muslim evangelism. Maybe go to uh, Pakistan or northern India or something like this. And I said, do you have a car? They said, yeah. I say, do you get your gas at the pump or do you go in and pay at the gas station? Because most of the gas stations around here just happen to be run by Pakistanis. I say, go in and get to know them. Learn their names. Remember them. Bring them cookies. I, I was just in, in Eastern Europe. I was in Sarajevo, uh, Bosnia, uh, Herzegovina, just last week. And this guy who was there doing ministry said, you know, we're mostly Muslim in this country. He says, anybody can lead a Muslim to Jesus if you're willing to open your door and open your refrigerator and be hospitable. Go and learn their names, and they'll remember yours if you bring them cookies and love on them. And then if you need content, you can move in this way that Lewis sets forward for us. Okay, so that, that's it on... Um, how, how, where, where's Joel? Where did he go? How late are we supposed to go? How much time do I have? I have to solve the problem of evil. I need to know how much time. <laughs> huh? 30 more minutes? Wow. <laughs> all right, so let's solve the problem of evil in 30 minutes, all right? So um, this, this was the big issue for Lewis. You, you, we, we've got Lewis to, to Christianity, all right? He becomes a Christian. But he still, he had wrestled with the problem of evil. How does he resolve this? And, and I, I, I don't think anybody is going to get a last word on how to resolve this. But I think you could get a substantive word. I think you could get a good skeletal structure for understanding how to deal with the problem of evil, and we can flesh it out with ongoing learning about the topic. But there are some preliminary considerations I think we have to have in mind before we even talk about it. Number one, how the problem affects us at one moment in our life may be different than how it affects us at another time. How it affects one person in one moment may be different than how it affects them in another moment. Here's my example. Now, years ago, when Claudia and I were ministering in Southern California, we had a college ministry there, and there was a guy in the college group named Dave Bird. He came to me and he said, my great aunt is dying of cancer. Um, would you be willing to go talk with her? about spiritual things. I said, if she's willing to meet with me, I'd be happy to. And, and he, his great aunt and great uncle had no kids. His grandparents lived in Connecticut. We were living in California. And they said, these are like surrogate grandparents to us. And so he set up the appointment. It was for 10 o'clock on a Friday morning. I show up at the house and I ring the doorbell. I know his great aunt has been bedridden and very ill. I ring the bell and, and she comes to, uh, she doesn't come to the door, the great uncle comes to the door. And as soon as the door opens, he starts screaming at me. What kind of a God do you serve? Why would God make my wife suffer? She's a good woman. Why does he have to suffer? She have to suffer. Why doesn't he take some dictator, give them cancer <coughs> instead of him, uh, my, my wife? And he's just screaming at me. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't need to be here. You know, but I promised Dave I'd talk with his aunt. So, He's screaming at me, takes me through the living room. We come into the den, and there's the great aunt sitting in a chair. 
And I knew it's taken her tremendous effort to get up and get dressed for this. She has a wig on because of the hair loss from cancer treatment. She has an outfit on that fits her like a tent because of the weight loss. She has all kinds of makeup on, but no makeup on the gray of her skin that shows the ashen gray color that is evidence that she's close to death. The great uncle continues to scream at me for about 15 or 20 minutes. And I'm looking at her. And finally, he just stomps out of the room. I look at the great aunt, and she says, I'm dying of cancer. Can you tell me how I can go to heaven? And I got on my knees next to her, and I shared the gospel with her. She prayed to trust Christ. Six weeks later, she died. The family asked me if I would be willing to preach a funeral. I preached a funeral, and I told that story of that day when I went by. I left out the part about the great uncle. <laughs> I told the story. As soon as the funeral was over, the great uncle comes walking up to me like this, lickety split, and I'm going, oh, my word. Is this going to happen again? He grabs my hand in both of his with tears coming down his cheeks, and he said, thank you for coming by that day. Thank you for coming by that day. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Light went on for me. Of course he was angry. Why? He was losing his wife. Of course she was interested in wanting to know how to go to heaven. She was losing her life. And he came up grateful because why? He saw the comfort his wife enjoyed the last six weeks of her life with her newfound faith. And, and sometimes this affects us different ways. As a matter of fact, how about yourselves? Um, I want you to take for a second and think of the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. You got it in your mind's eye? Okay, now think of the next worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. You got it? Now think of the next worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. Got it? Now think of the next worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. Now think of the next worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. Now think of the next worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. In the next. Okay, now think of the next worst thing that ever happened to you in your life. And the next, some of you are smiling. I don't get it. We're talking about bad things. That's because the list doesn't go very long when you really start thinking about it. I've asked this question in Ceausescu's Romania, behind the Iron Curtain, in a room full of people, all of whom had been tortured for their faith. Nobody got to 10. I asked it in Sudan in Khartoum to southern Sudanese refugees, black South, Afri uh, South Sudan Africans, all of whom had seen relatives hacked to death by the Janjaweed. Nobody got to more than 10. Maybe you could get to 20 or 30. But by contrast, think of the good things that have happened to you in your life. And my guess is that second list is going to go on and on and on. The bad things that have happened to us are errant brushstrokes across a huge canvas of good. Now, I, I remember once I got cut on my finger all the way to the bone. I had to go to the hospital to get it sewed up. It's, it was less than, 10, less than 1% of my body, but it got all my attention. When we experience something bad, it gets our attention, okay? But go back to that list of bad things again. How many of you, with those bad things that were on your list, saw some good come from some of that bad given time. Whether it was resolved or not, maybe you grew in wisdom through it. Maybe you grew in empathy through it or something like this. How many of you saw some good come from some of the bad that you had on your list? Virtually all of you. If you've seen good come from some of the bad given time, you have good reason to believe good could come from all of it given eternity. You have no good reason to ever say no good could come from the bad you're experiencing at that moment because your own experience counts against that kind of judgment. 
And yet if somebody is feeling this way, we want to be um, tender towards them because they're hurting. Okay? So anyway, those are some preliminary considerations. But there's more. Lewis says, if this world is half so bad as people think it is, then how did we ever come to attribute it to the work of a good God in the first place? And I think what we've just described shows us some of the reasons why. Because really, the evidence seems to indicate that there is good and the bad's a perversion. And this gets us to the point of definition. What Lewis does well for us is he's constantly defining terms for us so that we can think inferentially in as sound a way as possible. So he says, what, what, what's the definition? when We talk about the problem of evil. It's basically this. If God is good and all-powerful, why does evil exist in the universe? You've got to have all those elements in it for it to be a problem. If God's good but not all-powerful, there's not a problem. It's just tragic. If God's all-powerful and it's not good, it's tyranny. But if God's good and all-powerful, why does evil exist in the universe? How do we resolve this? The whole discussion falls under a category in theology and philosophy called theodicy, a term coined by um, Leibniz, the philosopher. Theodicy comes from two Greek words, theos, God, dike, righteousness. How do we justi show justification of God given the existence of evil in the universe? Christians have had basically two overarching approaches. There are lots of other nuanced approaches, but two basic ones. One comes from a tradition that we receive from Augustine and Boethius, and it's called a free will theodicy. Evil is a consequence of the ill use of free will. Another one, is, and it could be human free will or, or supernatural free will, diabolical free will. Another view is the view that comes down to us from St. Irenaeus, and that is what they call soul-making theodicy that somehow there can be some improvement of the soul due to the suffering we endure. It would be something that we would pick up in the verse in Hebrews. Jesus learned obedience from the things he suffered. Jesus was not fallen, but he was still able to grow even through difficulties he endured. Okay, so with that in mind, we now come, those are all preliminaries. You'll pick up a lot of that at the beginning of the problem of pain. But now we come to Lewis looking at this, and he's going to first take on the desire to redefine for us what we think of divine omnipotence, and then he's going to define what we think of divine goodness. With divine omnipotence, we're going to see what he thinks of free will theodicy. With divine goodness, we're going to see what he thinks of soul-making theodicy. So back to divine goodness. Our divine omnipotence. He begins that chapter in The Problem of Pain with a quote from Thomas Aquinas. Nothing which implies a contradiction exists in the divine omnipotence. Nothing which implies a contradiction exists in the divine omnipotence. There are some things, then, that God cannot do. If God is love, he cannot be unloving. If God is good, he cannot be evil. If God is just, he cannot be unfair. If God, is on, uh, uh, if God is immutable and unchanging, he can't be capricious. God is all-powerful to do all that is consistent with his nature. He can't do anything that is inconsistent with his nature. So if he creates a universe to operate with certain laws, he can't both create it with laws and not create it with laws at the same time. God doesn't do nonsense. One time I was working out in my garage, and I opened a cupboard door, and a wrench fell out of the cupboard door onto the floor. I bent down to pick it up. And the time I bent down to pick it up, I'd forgotten that I'd left the cupboard door open. So when I stood up, I banged my head on the cupboard door, and my head was bleeding. And in that moment, I let God know what I thought of his universe. <laughs> When we bang our heads, for some of us, it's more of a liability than for others. The Bible says God has the hairs of our head numbered, which means he knows less and less about some of us every day. <laughs> but I thought to myself a moment later, what did I want God to do? Do I really not want things to stay where I left them? Do I want to drive my car to Woodfield Mall to go shopping only to come out afterwards and find out it's in a mall in Nebraska someplace? Do you really want to take off on an airplane while the laws of aerodynamics are sound only to find out that those laws change mid-flight? 
And consequently, I, frankly, if that happens, I don't even want to live under where airplanes fly. No, if there are laws, if the universe is operating according to particular standards, human error doesn't implicate God. And human evil doesn't implicate God either. And, and we may want God to step in and change things, but what are we really asking him to do? By the way, there was a DC-10 that took off from O'Hare Airport in 1979. And right after takeoff, one of the engines on one of the wings fell off, and everybody on that plane perished. Uh, any of you at Wheaton College, Judy Bryson, you know her in the bookstore? Judy Bryson's dad was on that plane. And, and, and the, when they did the investigation, they found out one mechanic didn't tighten one bolt to specification, and the accident occurred. They also discovered when they put it through tests that, in fact, had the pilot assessed it quickly, he could have had enough thrust, he could have pulled out of that. There, they, put, um, they put other pilots through this, th this test in training, and, and consequently there were other times when engines fell off and people were saved because of that accident. But nevertheless, there you go. Now, years ago, Mattel, the toy company, made a doll. And they made a doll that had a little ring in its neck. And if you pulled the ring, the doll would say, Hi, my name is Chatty Cathy, and I love you. Did anybody here ever have a Chatty Cathy doll? I know, but you, you had a what? I'd say, I love you. <laughs> it didn't really love you. <laughs> Crystal, I'm sorry. Chatty Kathy didn't really love you guys. Are there any psychologists here? They might need some. <laughs> God could have put a ring in our neck. And he could have pulled it. And we could have said, hi, God. I'm Jerry, and I love you. Right? But would that have been real love? No. God commands love. <clears throat> he commands us to love him. He commands us to love our neighbor. He commands us to love our spouse. He commands us to love our children. He commands us even to love our enemies. As soon as you command love, you raise it from the realm of mere emotion, and place it in the realm where there could be volitional response. So consequently, God could have made us with this little ring in our neck. Now, I may pray, you know, Lord, please remove evil from this world. So, so here's Wayne. We've been friends for, well, you moved here in 82? 81. So we've been friends for 37 years. And he's got this military background. He's a tough guy. Matter of fact, you don't know this about him, but he's got black belts in 17 different forms of martial arts, and he could reach in and pull out my heart and show it to me beating before I die. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true or not, but let's say for sake of illustration, it's true. And I say something really stupid, which I'm very capable of doing. And, and Wayne says, you know, Jerry, um, I know we've done those books together. I want to protect my reputation a little bit. That was pretty stupid what you just said. And now I'm sort of embarrassed because he's caught me. So I try and cover it up, a little pretense or something like that. And he points that out. And now I'm getting kind of mad and I'm feeling embarrassed. And he points that out. And finally, he gets ready to leave. And I can't take him on straight on because he's got that you know, ability to show me my heart beating before I die. So I grab a chair here, and just as he's ready to go out, because I pray God remove evil in this world, but now I don't want any evil removed. I've got some business to do. I'm going to hit him with, over the back of the head with the chair because I need some distance between me and him. And just as the chair comes down and starts to make contact with his head, God intervenes, turns it into a feather. It tickles Wayne in the back of the neck. He loves to be tickled. He turns around with this big smile on his face. I'm furious that's not the effect I wanted to produce. I pull out the 357 Magnum I always carry with me. I fire two rounds at Wayne. God intervenes, turns those lead bullets into marshmallows, slows down their speed. They ricochet gently off his stomach right into his hand. 
He likes marshmallows. He pops those puppies in his mouth. He's so happy. I'm furious. I throw the gun at him while the gun's tumbling through the air. God intervenes, turns the gun into a sponge. He needs a sponge. He's newly married. He's going to take a bath tonight. <laughs> I'm so upset, I scream obscenities at him before the sound waves can reach any ears. God has dissipated the sound waves. What just happened? God put a ring in my neck. You see, if God gives us free will and then removes the consequences of the ill use of free will, Aquinas had said nothing which implies a contradiction exists in the divine omnipotence. What are we expecting from God? And there can be all kinds of problems. You know, we can talk about natural disasters. Why is it a disaster if nature does what it does? Natural disasters are natural disasters because oftentimes of human incaution. It's a nice view on this cliff over Los Angeles. But if I move close to the cliff, it's possible there could be some, some mudslide or the house could go. If I get a nice beach property in North Carolina, it's possible a tornado could come. But not a tornado, a hurricane. You could buy some really nice property cheap in California on the San Andreas Fault. Or buy a nice place by a volcano in Hawaii. And sometimes it's human error. But, but, but Lewis even says there could be diabolical ill use of free will. When Jesus is in the boat and the storm comes up and the disciples wake him up, I don't think they woke him up thinking he could calm the storm. I think it was all hands on deck. Here's a bailing pail. Because when Jesus does calm the storm, he says, O ye men of little faith. But he rebukes the wind and the sea. Why would he rebuke the wind and the sea at that moment if he saw it was from the hand of God? I think he would have, instead, if it was from the hand of God, said something like Dietrich Bonhoeffer's poem, New Year 1945. If it be ours to drink the cup of grieving, even to the dregs of pain at thy command, we will not falter, thankfully receiving all that comes from thy loving hand. But he rebukes the wind and the sea, so he saw some other source behind it. There's a lot going on here. Okay, move from that. That's sort of in the free will theodicy area. Gives you a skeletal structure with some definition. You could flesh it out further on your own. But now you come to the issue of divine goodness. And here Lewis is moving now towards uh, the sort of soul-making theodicy. If you ask the average man on the street what the opposite of Satan is, what would they likely tell you? Excuse me, what the opposite of God was, what would they likely tell you? Satan. But is Satan the opposite of God? No. He's a created being, not an uncreated being. He's not omnipresent. My guess is probably none of us have been tempted by Satan. He probably spends his time on the big guys, you know, the Pope, the Metropolitans in the Orthodox Church, maybe the head of the Southern Baptists or the Anglicans or something like that. No, he's got his minions. He's got his lowerarchy of demons. I think we can be, be diabolically hassled, but, but, but he, he's, he can't be everywhere at the same time. He's also not very bright, Satan. The Bible says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. He likes to traffic in fear. He likes us to be afraid of him. He likes us to treat him as if he somehow is some rival for God. But that's all a myth. The scriptures say, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Um, I think that, that, that he's a fool. He thinks he has a chance. And he doesn't have any chance. Remember that great hymn by Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. One little word from God shall fell him. You read the book of Revelation, and what does it say? Satan is released on the earth, and he hassles everybody, and it says, and still the people don't repent. Then he does more bad things, and it says, still the people don't repent. And then all of a sudden, it says, God directs a strong angel to come and bind him in a chain and throw him in the bottomless pit. Takes, takes care of that like that. You say, why didn't he do it earlier? Because he was still giving people a chance to repent. Satan's in solitary confinement for a thousand years. He's released for about five verses. Does more havoc. The guy's reprobate. He's a fool. He, he still does this bad stuff, but, but, but then okay, he says, okay, it's done. You're there for the rest of eternity. He's unrehabilitatable. Okay, if, if you ask the average person on the street what the opposite of good is, what would they likely say? Evil. But is evil the opposite of good? No, Christians are not dualists. You cannot, the Christians believe good is primary, evil is a perversion of good. 
Lewis talks about this in The Problem of Pain. He talks about it in Mere Christianity. He's borrowing from a long tradition. Evil, you can't think of a bad banana without thinking of a good banana that goes bad. You can't think of, uh, we would put it like this way, evil compares to good like bread mold compares to bread. But what can man do with bread mold as creative as we are? We can make penicillin from it. We can take something bad from the bread and make something good out of it. Will we believe that God is at least not that powerful? That he could take the bad that we've experienced and somehow bring good out of it. Go back to those bad things that you went through and you saw some good come out of it. Do we believe ultimately good could come from all of it? And ultimately, we see the most heinous act in human history. What was it? It wasn't suicide. It wasn't homicide. It wasn't, it wasn't genocide. It was deicide. God kills, man kills God when God becomes a man to communicate his love for us. And what does God do with that heinous act? He turns it on his head and brings about the resurrection and works within the system that he created to bring about some eternal good. And basically, that's the way Lewis goes. We could say a lot more about it, but I, I just want to leave it, I, I think I want to leave it there with maybe one last observation. And the last observation would be, Lewis asks us, can pain be compatible with good? And he says, my, good, my goodness, have you never been to a dentist? I had cancer several years ago. The doctors didn't give me good odds. And there was a surgeon who made an incision about 18 inches long in my body. I don't believe that surgeon had ill will towards me, but he sure caused me a lot of pain. But he also cut out all that cancer and brought about great good, and I'm in the clear. And I think that we have to understand it in something like this. Again, you have to take it by faith. I played football when I was in college. We had championship teams. I was on three championship teams. My senior year, we were the number one offense in the nation in NAIA Division I. And our coaches were ruthless. They drove us and drove us and drove us, but you win championships with coaches like that. But at the time, you're not too happy about what they're doing. There's pain that's compatible with that which is good. Anyway, that's basically where Lewis would go. My guess is if you have at least a skeletal structure of that understanding, we didn't spend, you know, I think I've read maybe 600 books on this issue of the problem of evil. And, and I still feel like I'm scratching the surface. But if you have a skeletal structure of understanding, you have something to go with when somebody asks you a question about this, and you could eventually turn it to Calvary and to the resurrection, which is the ultimate answer to the problem of evil. Okay? Joel?